Thank you so much. And it's so real a pleasure and honor to be here. Um, let's just start with my d disclosures. I don't have any um, funding from industry. <clears throat> I have a grant from a nonprofit to help do teaching for journalists. So, um, so the, this meeting is about trying to think about how to do more effective, reliable communication. And um, just to start, I mean, we know that there's all sorts of problems with medical messaging. They're, they're often exaggerated, oversimplified, they lack context, they're uncritical. Um, and the result is that people often lack the information they need to make sense of claims or to decide whether to believe them. That may be part of the reason for the discussion we just had about uh, the difference between doctors, the clinicians and the researchers and patients in what they want. <clears throat> and the problem is that bad communication leads to unrealistic beliefs about health risks, about the interventions that we can do to reduce risks, and it can lead to wasteful or harmful decision making. Um, so the, the problem is we're in this very complicated communication environment. The message sources, researchers, regulators, public health people try to generate messages and they try to reach different audiences, including the public, clinicians, and, and so on. And the media and co other communicators are in the middle, medical journals and the news media. And, um, and then there's other stuff around it, like press releases and all this sort of stuff. So it's, it gets very difficult to get the message from the beginning to the end in a reliable way. <clears throat> and the problem is, you know, everyone, everyone hates everyone, <laughs> right? So the, the message sources think, oh, the media is terrible. The, all, the people are stupid. Um, the communicators think, well, my, our sources exaggerate. The, I can't believe the, anything that the researchers say. And again, the audiences that I'm talking to are stupid, so we can't, we have to dumb the messages down. We can't give numbers and that sort of stuff. <clears throat> and then the audiences think, well, you can't believe what you read. The, the, the messages change all the time. The media is unreliable. And the information is just too hard to understand. So this is a disaster. Oh, and then, of course, press releases, everyone thinks that they're just you know, lies and nonsense. So this is a disaster. And there's problems at every level. And it's really unhelpful to just point the finger at everyone. So what I want to do is I want to think, reframe it a little bit and say there's problems at every level, but there's also opportunities uh, at every level. Um, so, and really the bottom line is what we need, all of us, is a commitment to do better and then the training to make this possible. Um, so, press releases can be really powerful. I'm going to talk about it a little bit. and They can be really good. Um, the message sources can partner with the media. They have, they, the, their audiences are very smart. Um, the communicators need to be able to work with their, with their sources and again, have respect for the, their, their audiences. And, and people need to um, develop the confidence that they can approach messaging with healthy skepticism and see through nonsense. Um, and there's lots of efforts to do this. So for example, there's the, I don't know if you guys know about the Peer Review Congress. It's like the Olympics every four years. It's, this is a meeting that for it's called journalology, so it's the the study journal science, how to do a better job communicating, and there are people who do research. We need better. Here's a place where we need more and better research to improve the way that journals and journal editors work to make sure that the messaging is reliable. Um, for press releases, is a project that I'm working on to try to develop reporting guide, guidance for press officers so that they can do a better job. Um, Medicine and media is a way to help the, the communicators do a better job. We had three days here, and I've been running these workshops for people um, for, for, ten, for 10 or 15 years. Um, and journalists are really interested to do a better job. They want to do a better job, and with just a little bit of help, they can. And then finally, the audiences, they need to be smarter. And there's lots of resources. This is just self-serving, but this is a book that I, I wrote. But there's other people who've done work as well. And, um, Informed Health Choices, you heard about it before. This is a wonderful project that started in, in Norway with Andy Oxman and Camilla and Raphael here are, are important members of that group. But the idea is we can reach, in this case, young people, and in my case, ad, um, adult people, and help them learn to be better consumers of information. So what I want to talk about now, I just, um, just want to give a quick case example to show how all these problems play out. This is an example where everything went wrong at every level. We didn't have to. Um, and it's, <clears throat> anyway, and, and, and I just want to also talk about <clears throat> one thing about press releases. So this was, <clears throat> excuse me, this was a headline in USA Today um, a few years ago. This is one of the 
big newspapers in the United States, and it says, just a few sips of soda or juice daily may end up, <clears throat> may, may up cancer risk by 18%, study finds. Great headline, you see this, everyone's like, because everyone drinks these things, and like, wow, I'm gonna die now, um, <laughs> terrific. Um, and so, so I just wanna point out a few things, probably obvious to you, increased cancer risk by 18% sounds big, um, 22% risk of breast cancer, 18% risk of cancer overall, and it was published in the British Medical Journal, so very credible. Um, so the, the one obvious problem, and again, th this is a simple example, and, but there's many examples I could use, but this is a simple one. Um, one example here is they didn't, never reported the actual risk. What, what's the magnitude of the risk? <clears throat> it increased by 18%, 18% of what, right? <clears throat> and we all, I'm sure you all know this, the difference between relative and absolute risk reporting. So here, if uh, you have an intervention in the placebo group, 30% of people die, in the drug group, 10% of people die, that's a relative risk reduction of 67%, but it's an absolute risk reduction of 20 percentage points, okay? The problem is, if you change the rates, the lower the, the, the base rate from 3% to 1%, you still have a 60% reduction but, or, or even lo smaller numbers, 0.003% and 0.001%, again, it's still the same relative risk reduction, but the absolute risk reduction is much, much smaller. If you don't realize that, and some people don't, and the way that this media reporting that I, that I showed you, people get the wrong impression. When, th when events are rare and you only see the relative risk reduction, you think it's a really big problem when often it's very small. This is called framing. The same information looks bigger when presented um, in relative compared to absolute form, especially when the base rate is low, which is often the case, fortunately, in medicine. And there's an extensive literature showing how this can lead to bad decision making. Um, this is the, so, so, so the media did a bad job here, no, no question about it. Um, this is the original article, the source article. It was the British Me Medical Journal, one, I think one of the best journals out there. And this article, like a lot of nutritional epidemiology studies, gets massive um, attention. It has an altmetric score of 3,300, um, the eighth highest altmetric score ever for BMJ, top 5% in, the, in their history of altmetric. Um, and so let's look at the article. They didn't report absolute risks either. And not in the abstract, not even in the article. It's, it's like mind-boggling. They just gave relative numbers, a, a hazard ratio of 1.18 for any cancer and 1.22 for breast cancer. Um, and that just, I'm sure you know this, but that's where the 18% higher and the 22% higher comes from, that, the, the, those relative numbers. The question is higher than what, right? It's an obvious question, but people often forget about it and they get fooled. And it matters, like I said, absolute relative makes a huge difference. So the British Medical Journal didn't make it easy for the press officers or the journalists, because if you were a, a, a smart journalist or a smart press officer and you're like, well, I know about absolute relative, I wanna figure this out, if you look in the article, this is how they reported it. They never gave the absolute numbers. They gave tables which had a numerator and a denominator. They, the chance of diagnosis um, for the people with the least consumption of these sugary drinks, 743 out of 25,000 people were diagnosed with cancer. That's 3%. And then if you look at the, um, the highest consumption group and you divide it out, it would be 414 over 25,000, that works out to be 1.6%. Then you think, wait a second, you just told me that drinking this stuff is bad for me, but my chance of, of getting cancer is lower. What's going on? You're, it's crazy. And that's just because there's a lot of, you know, the adjustment here made a huge difference. There's a lot of potential confounding. And so if you actually did this properly, you, you would multiply the base rate by the relative risk the hazard ratio 1.3, and it turns out that's 4%. So it works out that it is higher. Um, <clears throat> but if you were a press officer or a journalist, that's, you know, that's a lot to ask. And it doesn't have to. It should be easy. It should be straightforward. So um, anyway, the press release, the BMJ's press release did the same thing. They just gave these relative numbers. So it's, uh, again, 18% increase, 22% increase, no base rates. So it's no surprise that all the media, I mean, I looked at... Um, there were hundreds of, it got a huge amount of coverage. And I would say almost every media outlet reported it the same way, wrong. You know, so CNN, health, huge, 22% increase. New York Times, the best, right? Um, same thing. Um, I forget what this one is. Oh, Reuters, the, the, uh, so it's a, a, a 
press service, so everyone, other media draw on this. Again, the same thing. So it's, a, it's no surprise, and a, a disaster didn't have to happen. Um, in, in terms of press releases, um, I, I think press releases are actually, you know, most people hate them. Like, everyone makes fun of them, and every, everyone denies that they use them. But it turns out uh, journalists rely on them very heavily, and, um, which is a problem when they're bad. But if they're good, it can be really useful. It's a lever that we should use to improve the quality of media reporting. So Lisa Schwartz and I did a paper looking at the influence of medical journal press releases on the quality of the, the subsequent media coverage. And what we found, what we tried to do is we tried to see if the press release included critical information, was it more or less likely to be in the media than if it, if it didn't? So for example, if the press release mentioned things like the quantified effects, like in this one, or if they uh, talked about um, limitations, like be cautious about drawing causal inferences from observational studies, did you see that in the, in the subsequent media? And then, so we looked at, studies that had a, did not have a press release, studies that had a press release, and studies that, had no, uh, that did, did, did include that information, and then ones that had no press release at all. And then we just saw what proportion of the subsequent media coverage included those quality measures. Um, and we isolated the effect of the press release because we, we accounted for whether the journal abstract or if there was an editor's note had this information. And what we found, you know, was a really powerful association. If the main, if the press release didn't quantify the main result, then um, um, only 31% of the subsequent media coverage quantified the main result. But if the press release did quantify it, twice as much, 61% quantified the main result, right? And if there was no press release, there was no effect. And the, we see the same pattern um, for harms. If the harms are mentioned in the press release, they're more likely to be mentioned in the, in the media. If um, the limitations are in the, in the press release, they're much more likely to be in the subsequent media than if they weren't in the press release. So that just shows you that this is a great opportunity that we should use to try to help get the word across. Um, so what difference does it make? Does, does bad communication matter? Well, it, there are harms. And here's an example. So I've talked about the, the, the source did a bad job. The journal, the communicators did a bad job. And unfortunately, the audience did a bad job, too. Um, this is a media story that I found, which is just awful. But it's, th this is a story. This family had this young child who died of cancer. And the family saw this paper. They saw this media report. And they thought, it's our fault. We gave our kids sweets and bubble tea regularly. And the child died. It's our fault. I mean, this is horrible. Right, and and so this is an example, you know, where it's a message that got communicated badly, and unfortunately, people in this case weren't able to see through the the, the problem. Um, anyway, so um, it should have been better. It could have been better. The journal could have insisted that the authors include absolute risk in the article. The press release should have reported them. And even if the journal article and the press release failed, journalists could have asked the authors, or they could have done these calculations. I mean, I was able to do the calculation. If I could do it, anyone could do it. So um, you know, the, you just, it was you know, a little tricky, but you, you, they could have just said 3% versus 4%. Is that big or small? Now you decide. Um, so we know that problems with the media reporting are well known. There was a recent um, systematic review of articles of uh, assessing the quality of news stories about the effects of health interventions and found that very few mention conflicts of interest, many few talk about, uh, very few talk about alternative, alternate interventions besides the one at hand, um, a minority report potential harms, and very few report benefits or harms using absolute <coughs> risks. So that can be better. That's part of the curriculum of our medicine and media courses to try to improve that situation. And again, the, the, the systematic review didn't look at, I don't know why, they didn't look at whether there were about cautions, about causal inferences from observational studies, but we know from other work that that's often, more often not included in reporting as well. And actually, if you want to read about a, a really nice article, that, uh, actually all the authors are here. So Camilla um, and, um, um, Actually, yeah, all four, all four of the authors are here. See, it's a Rezzoni, Ambrosini, De Fiori, Aldrighi, Opus, Magnum, Magnum Opus. But it's about problems in um, media reporting in, in Italy, in Italian media, um, failing to acknowledge 
the limitations of, of observational research and specifically to making in, improper causal inferences. So um, anyway, the, just want to kind of sum up. I think the, what we need to do is we all, we all want the same thing. We all want to do good science and we want to get that science implemented and we want to, to do that we need to communicate it to other scientists, to regulators, to, you know, and that's the, the, com the communication um, people in the, in the media, in the medical journals, that's their job and we need to work with them and they have to do a good job and then the audiences need to do a good job um, a, 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 as well. We need to make, help them do a better job interpreting things and being skeptical. So there's problems everywhere but there's opportunities everywhere. Um, we need better studies, with better outcomes. Um, Karsten talked about how often benefits are discussed but not harms. We need both those things done using reliable, transparent statistics. Um, so th there's a burden on the researchers. The communicators need to do a better job. We need editors to be better editors, to actually do some editing. I mean, that was a real editorial failure at BMJ. Um, and we need the people who write the articles to do a better job writing. And th uh, the audiences, we need them to read better. We need them to think better, to think more critically and have healthy skepticism so they can see through nonsense and find what truth is there and decide how concerned to be or whether to make, you know, act on, on the results of research. So anyway, that's just a quick run through of, uh, of all these, these issues. So thanks.